What's up everyone, my name is Mark, welcome to my channel. This is my journey where I'm gonna talk about the things that I've learned within the past year or so and tell you where I'm at currently in this space. But we're not gonna do it today here in my studio, instead we're gonna do it on my way to England because I am running out of time and I gotta get going, so come along with me. It has been two years since I started my journey. Not two years of me starting my YouTube channel, but two years of me trying to become a full-time trader and better investor. And I can probably say this, that I have become a significantly better investor, uh, but I did not achieve my goal as a full-time trader by this two-year mark. In fact, I will kind of consider myself a better trader than I was six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, but I did not achieve the goal that I had, which was to make X, Y, and Z every single day or every single month. Now, if you've been following me on my journey for the past oh, year and a half or so, every time I do my journey updates, I kind of talk about where I'm at in my trading, my YouTube channel, and just investing style period. And there was a period of time for like six months before I went back to a nine to five, which again, it wasn't something that I needed to do. I was offered a job that paid me very well, so I took it. But I was doing perfectly fine for six months. The problem was I never felt comfortable to rely on trading as my sole income. Because there was months where I made a couple hundred bucks, there was months I made a couple thousand bucks. There was, it was a roller coaster up and down. And when you don't have a consistent paycheck coming in every single month, it adds an additional stress to you. And I was just being real, I, I wasn't, I wasn't consistently profitable the way I wanted to be, and it did not make me feel comfortable. Luckily for me, I'm in a position where I don't need to work and I didn't need to trade. All right, so let's get to some of the questions right here. Um, one of the first questions is, now that the craziness of COVID markets is over, how have you adapted your trading and investing strategies to the new reality of the bearish market? that's an excellent question and um i had i have adapted to the bear market drastically um one of the things that i noticed that on the beginning phase of my journey i was just a bull and that was it there was no bear case to anything um so i have switched up many strategies First and foremost, I definitely started to get really proficient at fundamentals of a company, no matter what. If they're not profitable, I don't mess with them anymore. In fact, a lot of times, like there's a lot of good companies that have opportunity that are not profitable, but I like to find the reason why they're not profitable. Another thing that I rely on heavily when it comes to my entry points has been technical analysis, and I think I've been doing really, really good in that area. I need to look at both the bull and the bear case, for example, Amazon. Amazon, I love Amazon, I'm invested in Amazon, but if you look at the overall growth of the company, um, they don't really make that much money. Well, they make a lot of money, but they don't, when you look at the overall earnings reports and stuff, you'll see that they're Profit is not actually from this e-commerce store. It's actually from AWS and the AWS has slowed down these past couple of quarters Which is a little scary on the growth aspect of Amazon like have they peaked at this point? Is it gonna start slowing down significantly? Where are they pivoting to to try to increase and um, offset those losses in the AWS? So there's stuff that I have to look at on both sides. I still like Amazon overall. I'm still bullish on it long term um, but in, with that in mind, I start looking at the technical levels and see you at um, the levels that I can identify and where I feel comfortable at buying at. So I've definitely gotten better when it comes to that. When it comes to trading though, <clears throat> that's another story. So same thing with call and puts, you just going in one single direction. So it's kind of a gamble at the times, right? And if you get anything wrong, you exit quickly. If you don't, then you end up losing your investment or your trade. I start looking at other avenues of ways to make money and I start looking at more of low risk plays that I guess would have anywhere from 75 to 90% probability rate. And I would do those plays and just start compounding and just slowly stacking the, the chump chains, chump change, chump chains, chump change. I was in Mortal Kombat with a fucking bat. And um, just accumulated throughout um, several months to weeks or whatever. That has worked out 
um, perfectly for me because I've noticed I was looking at my portfolio recently. Um, since the summer when I started doing the cover calls, uh, I haven't really lost many cover calls. I have one bad play and I've been practicing vertical spreads. I've had one real vertical spread, did perfectly fine. Um, but my paper money trades, I'm practicing with the SPY for like daily vertical bear spreads. They've been doing pretty damn well. I think I'm seven and one so far as I'm shooting this video. And um, eventually I'm gonna start applying it in, with real money here soon, starting next year. Money is not money that's gonna just overnight make you rich. It's a compound effect where you're just kind of stacking cash every single week or every single month when you get out of these positions. Very different than naked puts and calls, which obviously increase the risk, but the reward is also significantly higher. And um, that's what I've been doing for six months and I'm comfortable with that. I'm happy with that. I like that. And I can't really complain. And I think I'm probably gonna continue to do this more than anything, more than just trading futures, more than just getting into blanket of calls and puts. Um, and my and I don't inspire to be this full-time trader right now, not because I don't want to, it's just, it does take a lot of work, a lot of dedication, a lot of time that I don't have. And I'm just being real with myself. Next question is, what do you think about Tesla? I think I've been pretty clear about Tesla. I am not a Tesla bull. I think it's a highly overvalued company that has a cold like following and people are buying into the future of what it could be and ignoring what it is right now. Um, I've been right on all of my levels that I called out on Tesla. It's not because I'm a genius. I think I just never feel comfortable paying for a car company regardless of what people want to argue. It's not just a car company. They have solar, they have this, they have that. In the end of the day, when you look at the quarterly earnings, it's a car company. It makes majority of its profits selling cars. They have great, they got a lot of cash. They make a lot of money off of the, um, the cars. It's not a bad company at all. I just think it's extremely overvalued and PE ratio means something. And in the end of the day, when, it's, when I see it, and I see it as a vehicle and not anything else, it's extremely overvalued. I know they have potential with the AI, the, um, the battery and et cetera. But right now I feel like there's a lot of competition coming down the pipeline. And I know the argument I've heard before, oh, investors have been saying that for years and you're absolutely right. But two, three years ago, they didn't have any EV vehicles that were hitting the market. Tesla was the golden goose that Tesla was it. Not only that, their Model S, not the Model S, the Model 3 was in the low 30s, you could buy it. Now it's in the low 40s, like mid 40 range. So they already priced out a lot of the middle class. And when you look at some of the vehicles that are coming out, especially like the uh, Chevy Bolt, which has this complete redesign, you get the premium package, like the top of the line one for 37K out the door. And when you look at that compared to the Model S, mm, that Bolt actually looks like a better deal and it looks a lot nicer and it feels more like a car and it still has a lot of the tech gadgets. Um, is the AI as fluid as Tesla? No. Um, do they have the great ecosystem when it comes to charging stations? No. But again, I think people are using it more for commute to and from work in, in a local area and they have no problem charging it at their home. So I think there's gonna be a lot more cars coming out there. Not only that, I don't think the sales are gonna be as impressive as people think it's gonna be in China. I also don't think it's gonna be as impressive in Germany. I also am not ignoring the fact that the demand is going to slow down for Tesla. And it seems like everyone's ignoring that. They're like, oh, it had 40% or 50% year over year returns and blah, blah, blah. But that, like, how long can you sustain that, especially with competition coming under, especially with a CEO that has been kind of off the hinges. He's, he is becoming more of a celebrity and Tesla's becoming more of an afterthought. So now, so the big question is, as for my YouTube channel, what am I planning on doing with my YouTube channel? Well, I gotta say when I first started a year and a half ago, it was like season one, it was doing really well. I loved it. It was great. The viewership was increasing significantly. I was actually on the uptrend. I was starting to trend. And then I took a three month break and I came back for season two. What kept me steady while paper trading when you when you don't expire FOMO? Um, I guess what she's asking is uh, what keeps me from 
put my phone on why do I do paper trading I'm okay with that well I can tell you um, I got into a trade before without understanding the strategy completely and lost a thousand dollars that's why lesson learned I'm not gonna do it again so I practice and practice and practice until I feel comfortable then I get in and actually start scaling in with low trades I did that with cover calls my very first one was um I started doing it with shit stocks the ones that are under ten dollars the ones that are not good companies the SoFi is the Matterport Palantir um, JetBlue, those, um, they were all under $1,000, so I was able to buy a 1,000 shares and just kind of milk them for like 20 bucks here, 30 bucks here, 50 bucks there, 100 bucks there, and that's how I learned, that's how I got comfortable, and I slowly started moving up um, how much money I would invest into these cover crawls. And I took it in a completely different direction, and because of that, I think um, I turned off some of the viewers, it wasn't what they were used to, I ditched the... Um, trading group reviews I also essentially stop interviewing certain people and try to bring on other smaller YouTube channels creators and people who had I feel like a lot of value to offer and um, if it was based off of ratings and a show in general like if it was a TV show on um, television network season one did very well season two would have gotten canceled so the question is Will there be a season three? What would I do again if I was 22 again? I would have never joined the military. And I know that sounds kind of crazy. Uh, just to be very clear, um, the military has taken a lot from me, <laughs> mentally and physically. But it has also made me into the person that I am now. And I don't think I would have been as successful as I am now had it not been for the military because it did teach me discipline. It did teach me um, work ethic. It did teach me to be mentally stronger, um, to toughen up and to um, be resilient when there are hurdles that hit you in life. Um, it's been really good for me when it comes to growing up as an individual and um, Although I try not to promote folks to join the military, I was in a situation where I just made a lot of bad moves in life and I made a series of bad moves where I was closing doors after doors after doors and it got to the point where the only way for me to leave Europe was for me to join the military so that to me was the easy way out and um, I learned the hard way but it did make me into the person I am today. And it was really hard for me to get out, especially the amount of years that I was in. Uh, but it was a risk I was willing to take. And um, I don't regret it at all. I've actually been doing a lot better outside of the military. Um, but I do think a lot of the, the work ethic and stuff that it has instilled in me. And, and the reason why I feel like I am successful, because I am. Um, I don't brag about it a lot. I don't talk about it. Or feel like I gotta go on um, like YouTube or, or Twitter and just brag. Um, but I would consider myself very fortunate in life. Um, I'm very blessed and uh, I believe in karma and I think I've been rewarded extremely well in life. And um, I hope that it will continue. So the question is, will there be a season three? And I gotta tell you, I don't know. I'm in England right now, I'm loving life and I don't know if there will be a season three. Here's one, honestly, why, honestly, we want to know why didn't you hit the ultimate dagger on Mr. Dunlap? So they're talking about um, the master investor himself, Ian Dunlap. Um, so that, that's, that's a really long story. I'm really not, I'm not a fan of always bashing people on my YouTube channel, contrary to what you may think sometimes when I call people out. Um, I really got along with the guy on the beginning phases of my journey. And uh, when I did the Red Panda review, it was never anything personal. It just kind of came down to the fact that I, I started learning a lot about him. I didn't do my due diligence about the individual behind the YouTube channel and behind the uh, Zoom calls and stuff. And I believed a lot that he was saying and his intentions. And, and come to find out there was a lot of stuff that really wasn't true about him. So I just kind of exit out of that community and I stayed quiet for several months but people could ask me like yo can you do a review can you do a review how do you recommend it hey do I feel like um I got scammed I paid this and this is all you get I know you're always in the room I know you're always talking so it became this 
whole thing. So I made the review and I tried to make it not personal. In fact, I didn't make it personal. I didn't throw any personal dirt about him in the video. It became personal when they played an audio tape to try to, or a voicemail audio tape, a voicemail of me on all the Market Mondays when they played, they played that tape which is like me on the beginning stages of my journey, which was like a way year prior. And it tried to like discredit me. And that's when it became personal. I was like, yep, you're exactly what I learned about you. You were exactly everything that I knew you were. And the reason why I stepped away. So I didn't feel bad for dropping the review. And I debated about actually throwing a dagger and taking him down with all the information that I knew. And then I decided I opted not to. I know he's a father too. Um, this is like his business. It is what it is. But I, I believe in karma. I strongly believe in karma. And I believe when you live a life of lies and over exaggeration and manipulative tactics and when you do certain shady stuff, it will eventually come back on you. And I think eventually people will just see who he is. So I don't have to put a dagger in his heart, I think he will destruct and destroy himself. Am I biased towards the Come Up series? You seem to always call out EYL, um, but not the Come Up series. Uh, the answer is short, yes, I am biased towards the Come Up series. Um, EYL first, I was heavily embedded into the community. The Come Up series came later. I learned a lot from both of them. When it comes to me being like an overall better investor, I would say that I've learned 20% uh, of my skills from the Come Up series, including from Q, 20% from Mo, who is who I do my podcast with, and then 60% is me just learning on my own audiobooks, reading books, doing research, and etc. The reason why I'm biased towards the Come Up is because. Again, I got to know everybody within EYL and within the Come Up series, and me and Mark just align more. He is a genuine dude. Um, there's no shadiness to him, at least from everything that I know about him, and I think is a good dude. I vouch for him any day, any night. I can't say the same for the folks at EYL. I have nothing personally against, like Rashad, Troy, or even like Wall Street Trapper. Like I think they're actually really cool people. Um, do I have questions about the legitimacy of Wall Street Trapper's background and story? Sure. But they're driven by other motives than what the Come Up series was driven by. And yes, people have lost money on being part of the Come Up series, especially the Rolling Force. There's no denying that. And I feel like Mark Monroe and his show itself have addressed it multiple times and have had to eat their own medicine sometimes saying, you know, we were wrong about certain things. If you guys follow my channel enough or follow the um, Money Market Truth the other podcasts I do. Me and Mark, we don't agree on a lot of things. We, we don't agree on Tesla. We don't agree on AMD. Uh, we don't agree on the rolling fours. We don't agree on, um, I guess, his bullish sentiment. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we don't agree on. We challenge each other. But I feel like I know him well enough to know that his intent is not to take advantage of people, his intent is not to make money off of people, his, his intent is not to monetize folks, his intent is really to try to help people, and I can't say the same for um, EYL. They both, both of these communities have had individuals on their show that have come to be known to be shady individuals. Uh, I just find that it's, that has happened quite more often on EYL. And where the, the EYL brand has shifted, it became more of a way to make passive income off of their audience by selling them products consistently, whether it's the Red Panda Star Club, whether it's their membership, which is $1,000, whether it's the you know, financial freedom course or the futures course or something. They're always trying to make money off of people and the prices are so high that it's gotten kind of ridiculous to the point where if you look at what you get and the value that you get, it does not justify the price. And when I look at Mark Monroe, his intent literally was try to help people. Did it backfire somewhat? Sure, absolutely. Oh, I'm not gonna say and deny it. Does he maybe associate with some people that may have 
been called out as questionable folks? Yes. Has EYL done it as well? Yes. So it's definitely a catch-22. I just know this guy more and I trust this guy more and his intent and his heart is 100% genuine, hence the reason why I rock with them a lot more than the EYL. They're, they're just different business models, different intent, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm biased towards the come up. That being said, um, I've lost money on the come up series as well. The rolling fours did not pan out for me, so there's no denying that. I think I've mentioned that before. Um, I think I, when I brought them on my channel, we talked about it as well. Um, and it wasn't the lack of the strategy not working. It was me being 100% greedy and over leveraging and not taking profit when I should have taken profit. Had he come out eight years ago, that strategy would have probably made millionaires, plenty of millionaires. Has the strategy made some millionaires? Yes, but I think it probably has been far less than anticipated and there's probably been a lot more people who lost money than they made money, so. Um, but yeah, no, I, I rock with them anytime. I I like them. I think they're also pretty open to criticism without getting their feelings all hurt. And like I said, he's, um, I feel like I know Mark, we're friends. And I think the guy is a legit dude. When I started investigating the background, I didn't see anything that seemed shady. So that's, that's on that. Hopefully that puts it to rest. Um, how was my portfolio allocated? Okay, so um, the portfolio that I share on my channel is my fun money portfolio. I invested, uh, let me go look real quick and I can tell you how much I actually invested into this portfolio, this portfolio alone. And um, I started that early 2021, like January or February. And I invested um, $12,306 is what I have in that portfolio. I am down $7,000. So yeah, it's not doing very well. Why? Because when I first started investing in this play, when I took that play money and invested in here, I over leveraged on some options, including XLK, which was my biggest loss. Square, I, Square and Meta were 60% of that portfolio, which is not smart. Again, that kind of shows you like where I've been to where I am now wasn't smart at all 60 percent in two stocks and they both clearly tanked so that's where majority of that money was lost it was xlk square um meta and then roblox those were my biggest losses everything else were like minimal losses if that and um just been doing you know the cover calls and the uh, vertical bear spreads and been making money off of those in six months not enough to offset the, the loss but you know it's working progress as for um, the rest of my money, I'm either I have cash or it's actually with my financial advisor, Jazz Wealth. And then I have a personal Roth that I manage myself as well that I put more money into. And then I also have a 401k that my company matches. And then I have a Fidelity account that I just started two months ago just for dividend stocks only, which I put a couple bucks in every single week or every single, pay every single paycheck, so every two weeks. That's what I do. Um, this this portfolio that I share, I have made a rule. I'm not investing more than $3,000 per year, and that is it. And that's my play money. Lose it, make gains. We'll see. It's my play money. The rest of my money is going into legit investments, which um, I actually been doing relatively well with. How come haven't I interviewed um, Black Panther, aka Lawrence? Um, I actually did. I did interview Lawrence months ago. So you guys know I took a three month break during the summer and I came back. He was my very first interview, but we had our interview. I think it went great. When I rewatched it, my audio was terrible. Like that's the reason why I have the Shuri microphone now is because I had his interview and it just sounded really, really bad with the Blue Yeti. My voice was just, it was like in and out, it was in and out, and it was really frustrating. It would take you out of the interview. So I completely trashed it. I apologized to him and asked if we could reschedule. And I actually did try to reschedule with him and we made plans. I was like, hey, can you, would you be down to the interview next week? Not, not, not the next, this next week, but prior to the, um, the event where him and Mark came together in Atlanta, and he said, sure, and I dropped the ball. I didn't follow up with um, the appointment that I had scheduled with him to link up to try to do that. So that was my fault. I actually apologized to him. I hope he didn't take any offense to it. And maybe in the future, if I'm still doing this, we, we can sit down, but that was my fault. That's the reason. It's not, I, I don't have anything against him. I had, like, not at all. Like, he's a cool dude. I get along with him. I just 
the interview just turned out really bad on the audio aspect of things. I couldn't fix it. So that's the reason why I trashed it. Same thing with TiVo, which I still never followed up on. I had interviewed him as well. And the audio was really bad, which prompted me to get the Blue Yeti. <laughs> and then um, because the audio was so bad with Lawrence, prompted me to get the Shuri. And now I haven't had any issues with the Shuri. I love that microphone. So, but those, those are the two that I did interview and I did end up trashing, unfortunately. Why did I stop? Why did I stop doing trading group reviews? Well, um, to be honest, I um, I went through a lot of those trading groups during a bull run, and I don't think I properly could vet them and their ability um, because it, everything was running up. So everyone was winning, everyone was making money. I don't know how they're doing now, and I would hate for people to see those reviews and then just go by what I recommended. Um, I do still stand by those reviews, but those were, you know, um, close to a year ago, several months ago to close to a year ago. But ultimately for you to become a better trader is for you to really do all the work, take the strategy, take the knowledge that you can obtain and then apply it and actually practice and don't rely on just call outs. I think call-outs is probably one of the worst things you can do is just follow blindly into these call-out rooms. So, but I, I just didn't, I didn't want to do it anymore because I didn't want, I didn't want to bring people down the wrong path. But yeah, it's, it's hard. It's very hard in this space um, to navigate with figuring out who's real, who's not. And I really go into these um, spaces now more as a pessimist literally thinking that everybody is fake. That's actually how I met Mo. <laughs> I thought he was some fake trader. And I actually know Mo, so me and him met face to face, we know our families know each other, like he, he is legit. Um, and it's it's really sad because it seems like the, the legit people are not getting the attention that they deserve. Will there be a season three? I don't know. But what I do know is that things sometimes have to end just like this.